Welcome to another Corporate Gamer Podcast. I am your host, Phil, also known as the Corporate Gamer. This is episode 22nd, recorded on August 4th, 2017, The Future of Arcades. Hope that everybody had a great week. Um, it's Friday, uh, beer time, everything is good. Um, and I wanted to start the podcast by uh, thanking everybody that's uh, listened to the podcast and that's read my reviews. It's really appreciated. Um, thank you very much for your support. Um, um, I've been wanting to do, um, I've been wanting to do radio for a long time and this is the opportunity with a very low cost and not having to apply anywhere to actually start off and doing some kind of radio show, talk radio show. And in any case, um, it's true that even on the mainstream, even on local radio or independent radio, it's very hard to actually talk about um tech or games or whatever and this is the best avenue so thanks everyone for for uh for subscribing to listening and i hope to to do this for a very long time all right so let's get get into this um what have i played in the last week um i've continued to play uh deus ex um actually i haven't played that much um i played last saturday that's the last time that i I think I'm on mission seven, I believe, um, of the first part, which is pretty cool. Um, it's fun. It's still fun. I'm still playing it. I'm still enjoying it. Um, there's parts that I keep forgetting, and it's, um, I don't know, I have to think about it twice, but that's part of the game. I just really, really like it, and I think that, uh, I think a lot of people did like Human Revolution, and uh, they should, uh, I think, if you haven't picked it up, you should definitely pick it up. I know I keep saying that, but. And uh, this week I also downloaded uh, Bayonetta on um, Xbox Live Free for Go- uh, Xbox Live Gold uh, Games for Gold. Um, Bayonetta was free starting August first, and I downloaded it. I haven't played it yet, but uh, I'm hoping that I'd be able to um, to play it soon. Um, all right, so let's get into the news of the week. First story, um, it's a story that actually caught my attention um, earlier in the week. Um, I haven't read deeply into it, but I saw a few um, a few articles on this, and uh, one of them was on Ars Technica. Um, it's NVIDIA and Remedy use neural networks for eer- eerily good f- facial animation. Um, I'll link this into in the show notes uh, just to, to show you, but... Essentially, what it is, it's that it's using, in, in, in this is the very dumbed down version of, of what it is. Essentially, what this is, is a um, uh, using AI in order to use facial recognition. And um, so basically, in the past, instead of, you know, you would have to record long periods of footage in order to be able to um, have enough to mimic facial expressions or have enough to produce a character. Now with about five to 10 minutes of, um, of footage and of work, you can pretty much do what you want with the AI, which is pretty impressive. Um, so I found this really cool because I think one thing that's been lacking in games, although the environments have looked really good, and at, at certain times the fa- you know the, the actors and the facial recognition were okay, I always found it something that kind of never made the jump in terms of quality, um, even the high-end games. And I think that this is a really good step in the right direction to make the games look as realistic as possible. Um, I think this is going to be a good um, a good step in the right direction. And, um, it's from the pictures and the videos that I've seen, it looks really impressive, really awesome. Um, I invite you guys to check it out. I'm not going to go into the tech details because, um, I just wanted to, to bring that to your attention for those that are, um, that are graphic geeks, I guess. Um, I found this really, really cool and there's parts of it that get pretty, well, not really t- pretty technical, but they 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 get a bit, a bit technical. Um, but it's really, really cool. And I invite you guys to check it out. So, uh, yeah, NVIDIA and Remedy 
uh, for you are team up for facial recognition or re facial animation, not recognition. My apologies. All right, next on the list. Beep, beep. Um, so this is one of those things where I consider this as being, you know, at one point McDonald's would always like say in the news or anywhere, um, uh, they would say like, oh, we sold our millionth hamburger or we sold our billionth hamburger, which we kind of don't care. Um, this generation of consoles, um, you know, there's, um, we know right now who's winning that, that race it may change by the end of this generation, but right now we know who's winning the sales race for the most units sold and it's the PS4. And they always seem to, or at least I always seem to see them in the news saying, hey, we hit the 50 million mark. We hit the 55 million mark. And um, at this point, it's like saying, hey, we're still selling, which is we all know you're still selling. Um, the official number, whoops, sorry. The official number uh, right now is 63.3 million units have been sold. Um, so obviously... They're expecting that by the time of this cycle, this generation cycle, um, PS4 will double Xbox One. Because I think unofficially Xbox, Microsoft doesn't really release sales numbers, or not, at least not very often. But as of the last numbers that I think people have come up, I think they were at 35 million. Which, um, it's, not, it's not too shabby, but it's not... No, I mean, compared to the other ones, not great. And the Switch is actually making a push for it too, right? So right now, they're still in the first year, within the first year selling, but at the pace that they're going, they will be outselling PS4 and Xbox One, assuming they maintain that same pace, which that's yet to be seen. Um, so basically, in the latest quarter, PS, there were 3.3 million systems that were that were sold. Um which is a slight drop from year to year from last year, which is 3.5. Um, but I mean, they're still selling. Uh, the Pro is still selling. It's selling really well. What I'm actually surprising, surprised to hear is that um, PlayStation VR seems to be picking up steam. They claim that there's been 1 million units sold of PlayStation VR since the beginning of June, which sounds like a lot. I don't know how many people would actually buy them. I think it's more of a luxury. Well, then again, a console is a luxury item, but I think it seems to be even more of a luxury item. Um, so I'm not sure if it's true, but hey, if they're saying that they're selling it, they must be selling it. And the estimate is that by the end of the fiscal year, which is March 31st, 2018, PlayStation expected to send or to, to so sell about 78 million uh, units, which is pretty impressive, if you ask me. Um, so basically, they're still saying that, you know, they're still selling their, their systems, um, which is fine. I'm still an Xbox guy. I don't care if there's exclusives or not. I'm in the ecosystem. I'm there. Um, it's going to take me a lot to actually move away. Um, I may buy a PlayStation 4 at one point, but I'm not going to move away from Microsoft. Um, there's complaints on both sides. There's complaints everywhere. I I think I've said this before. I'm one of those guys that was born with one console in the house, and you had we had one game, and you made sure you had fun with that game. So replay, you know, replay value for a lot of these games is big for me, and um, I'll go back and play the... Uh, the human revolutions or deus exes of this world and uh, I may go play Halo again even though they're not the best games in the world at least the last ones weren't um, that's my take on it and let me know what you guys think um, are you guys impressed by the number of PS4s being sold do you think it's going to slow down do you think it's going to go up what do you think is contributing to the success of the platform um, I think it's more I think personally what's what's being what PlayStation is doing well 
is they're getting a lot of marketing deals. I don't care if Microsoft poo-poos that idea, that it doesn't do much. You know what? In the minds of everyone, PlayStation is number one. A lot of times you see games that are PlayStation, but yet they're also for other consoles. But you, if you're the average consumer, you kind of don't know, right? Uh, for those of us who actually read up online and we know the games that are coming out, it's, you know, we know what's being sold for what console, but, you know, a lot of people don't have that. So, um, yeah, PlayStation's still selling it. Uh, they have a lot of exclusives. Um, they still have the indie market for now. Uh, we'll see if that continues. And uh, I think that's... And also the price point, which is actually pretty sweet. You can get a pretty cheap deal with bundles um, even now. So, um, yeah, PS4... PS4 sales top 63.3 million units as of now. Next story on the list. Nintendo Switch update fixes battery issue. So at the beginning, uh, so this is a story I saw on Game, uh, Game Rant. Um, so essentially, they were saying that, you know, at the beginning of the launch, there was uh, there was issues with the Switch, and most notably with the Joy-Con sick problems. That was fixed. And now they have apparently fixed another problem. Um, and I'm going to just read the, uh, the paragraph. According to myriad reports from Nintendo Switch owners, the system can often appear to go from a full charge to an almost completely drained battery in just a matter of minutes or it simply won't display that the battery is charged at all, even after sitting in its dock for multiple hours. The latest system software update aims to provide to fi a, fix, sorry, a fix to this troublesome issue by not only offering up general system stability improvements to enhance the user experience, but also by addressing an issue in which the remaining battery charge can't be displayed accurately. So basically, anybody that has a Switch is going to get this... Um, this um, this fix. Um, I don't know when it's going to be, but it's going to be in version 3.0.1. Um, and we'll see. Um, so if you own a Nintendo Switch and you're one of the lucky ones that was able to find one, which apparently it's still very difficult to find a, um, a Nintendo Switch. Um, yeah, you, you, <laughs> you're lucky. Uh, you'll have this issue probably fixed with the next iteration. All right. Next story. The um, this apparently got a. I don't know why it got a lot of steam online for whatever reason. And I'm not. I'm not saying from part particularly people on social media, but from uh, news outlets. So Super Mario Odyssey is first Mario game to get an E10 plus rating. So what that means is that it's rated for everyone 10 plus. So you have to be at least 10 years old and plus to. to to play it, um, people are wondering what's in the game that's making it so. I mean, uh, who cares? Um, at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure that people people that have you know families, they're still gonna play Super Mario Odyssey. Maybe it's because there's cities, or maybe cartoon violence. I guess because actually you can go into um, you can go into New York City or some big I think it's New York City, and uh, you can play around. But I mean, I don't see cartoon violence being an issue either because there's been cartoon violence in Super Mario games. Like, I mean, he jumps on mushrooms and they get knocked out. I mean, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I don't know why people are up in arms. I don't think it's going to do anything for the game. I guess it's an issue. Well, not an issue, but it's a big thing because... You know, it's Nintendo and Super Mario. It's kind of as bread, one of its bread and butter games. Um, and it's a very highly anticipated game. But I don't think there's any parent that's going to turn around and see, oh, look, it's an E10 plus rating. I'm not going to buy it. Uh, the majority of the kids that are going to be buying it anyways are going to be 10 plus. And to be honest, I know that I'm, I'm not a parent right now. And, um, and I can't really speak to people that have parents. And maybe you you know, um, listeners that have parents, that are parents, uh, will think differently. Um, I mean, in general, um, kids shouldn't be playing video games 
that early, at least on a regular basis. So yeah, it's okay to play a few games here and there, but I mean to actually be sitting down and playing video games. And this, it's a Super Mario Brothers game. And you see, and, and I'm going to compare it to myself. When I played video games, I didn't actually play them until I got the NES. And I got the NES in a, late in the cycle. I got it in the early 90s. So I was above 10. Uh, before that, I would actually watch my brother play video games, but I actually wouldn't play it. But I wouldn't, my, my parents wouldn't let me play, at least for a long period of time. Um, I used to play once in a while uh, at my cousin's house or whatever, but it was nothing, you know, amazing. Um, so I didn't really play till after 10, really. So, I mean, times have changed, I'm sure. And, you know, it's not as easy to to get video games away from the kids nowadays. But I don't think that they should be playing that many games anyway. So I, I don't think this is going to be doing it. I think this is... Uh, uh, nothing at all. I don't think this is any, there's anything happening here. Um, so yeah, what do you guys think? <laughs> uh, is it something that should be people should be concerned about in terms of the ratings, um, or is it something that no, it's it's nothing at all, and people are just gonna buy it? I personally think people are just gonna buy it. Um, the uh, the rating system is kind of a bit off, anyways. I think I already spoke that at one of my past podcasts. Um, it's it's wonky at best. It's not in this level of rating, but usually in the mature section, it's kind of ambiguous or a gray area. What's mature and what's not. So, um, yeah, Super Mario Odyssey is the um, E plus ten plus rating. Next on the list, it's not really um, it's not really a story, but more of a commentary. Um, so this week I saw the Wolfenstein 2 PC gameplay, uh, which basically goes through the first, whoops, the first level of Wolfenstein 2, and uh, I have to say, I know I said this during the, um, I said this during the E3, and um, I've been saying this a lot. I'm really looking forward to Wolfenstein 2 personally. I think it looks gorgeous. It looks like something I would have a ton of fun with. Um, and basically this this uh, trailer, you know, confirmed what I, I was really thinking. So um, it kind of resembles, I think it's similar gameplay, at least the gameplay that I saw. It looked very similar to Doom, um, the Doom 2017 version, where it's fast-paced, Go, 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 shoot, shoot, shoot. It, no, it's not really a stealthy game, I guess. In other games, in other versions, I think you could play a stealthy version or try and get through areas. Maybe that's still there. But from the gameplay that I saw, I was like, go in, shoot, 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 explode a big monster. And, you know, cutscene. Um, I really, really liked it. Um, I'm going to link the uh, the video in the show notes. Um, I'm, really into, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. And I think that... Uh, I think that a lot of people are going to have fun with this, um, especially if you like if you liked the previous um, the previous iteration of the uh, of the game and, and the new order. Um, I think this is going to be a worthwhile pickup. So check it out. Um, again, I was blown away by the video, the gameplay, um, and of course it was on PC. It wasn't on Xbox or or uh, or PlayStation, so it, it probably looked a lot better or. A little bit better at least as a, at a minimum than on the consoles but I don't care I still it looks amazing and I think I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna fall in love with this game uh, I, I just hope the rest of the game is just as fun I hope the storyline is also a little bit um, it continues well and strong it looks like a strong story it looks like something that I could get into but I just hope the ending doesn't become disappointing or becomes a to be continued episode um, then I'd be disappointed, but um, I'm definitely going to pick this up on day one. That's guaranteed. And I'll probably be playing it on Twitch. Uh, so this is coming out in September, I think, the end of September. So, yeah, I'm probably going to be playing this for sure. All right, next on the list, 
the games of the week for the week uh, starting July 31st to August 6th. I know I keep recording these on Fridays now, and, um, you know, there's always two days left to the games, and most of the games already came out, but uh, it's hard to get the ones for the next week because they keep changing ever so often. Uh, this, this week, the uh, list is kind of, uh, it's shorter than it was last week. Um, so let's start. Uh, Tuesday, August 1st, we have the Long Dark for the PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Patapon Remastered for the PS4. Uh, Avon Colony for the PS4 and Xbox One. Castle Storm VR Edition for the PSVR. Dimitrios, the big cynical adventure for the PS4. Dino Frontier for the PSVR. Draw Fighters for the PS4. Frisky Business for the PS4. Redeemer for the PC. Shadow Tactics Blades of the Shot uh, Shogun for the PS4 and Xbox One. Wednesday, August 2nd, there's Tacoma for the PC and Xbox One. The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel for the PC. And then yesterday, yes, yesterday, August 3rd, Slime Sand Switch, Retro City Rampage DX for the Switch, and Flight of Light for the Wii U. Again, I'm still baffled by the fact that the Wii U still has games coming out for it. Um, out of these games, there's Castle Storm that looks really cool. Um, but I'm not going to buy it because I don't have a PSVR. Um, heard good things about Shadow Tactics. Um, it looks to be pretty cool. Uh, other than that, there's nothing really that interests or piques my interest. Maybe one time, one day I'll, I'll try and pick one up. Um, I do recognize that there's a lot of PS4 games that are getting released on a weekly basis. And very few on the Xbox One. You know, just, well, few. There's three, four. Like, this week you had four, which is usually plenty. But, like, between PS4, PSVR, PS4, and the Vita. This week there's no Vita. But uh, normally, um, and there was only Redeemer for the PC. Which, you know, that was it. Um, yeah, it seems that there's a lot of releases for the PS4. And... Uh, you know, and manufacturers, and, and they're going to go for the biggest fan base. And right now, the biggest fan base is the PS4 and Sony's PlayStation. And last last generation, we had the, the Xbox 360. So uh, it's fair it's fair game. It's fair play. Um, I still think Xbox One is in a better position than Switch. But the Switch is not aiming for the same... Uh, the same... Uh, uh, audience uh, at this point, so... Uh, so those are your games for this week. Let me know what you guys think. Are you guys going to be playing any of these games? Let me know. And now we will go to the talking point of the week. And I actually wanted to do this uh, quite a while ago. Um, obviously, the title of the, uh, the show was The Future of Arcades. So obviously, you kind of knew what, what was coming. Um... So I wanted to go a little bit into what constitutes for me, um, what's an arcade, what was an arcade for me, what are arcades today, present day, uh, the versions of it, and what could be a potential arcade in the future if it does survive. Um, so, um, all right, so when I was a kid, Oh, my brother used to take me to arcades as a treat um, after a movie or whatever. And we used to go to arcades. And the games from the top of my head that I used to be able to play used to be WrestleFest, uh, Pro Wrestling, Final Fight, Streets of Rage, Mortal Kombat. Uh, if it was an older arcade and had older machines, maybe I had Pac-Man. Um it's one of it's it's uh, I can name a ton of them Royal Rumble. I used to love a lot of wrestling games back then. Operation Wolf, where you had the gun, and you were able to shoot. Um, so you used to go in, you know, put in your two bucks, uh, put in your quarter back then. Uh, most arcades used to have a pinball section, and then you had an actual arcade section. Then after that, the arcade grew. The pinball kind of died out a bit, which is a shame because pinballs. Pinball games are amazing. And then 
uh, I mean, that was before I got, probably I got the NES or around the same time. And even if when I got the NES, I didn't have a ton of games. So it was kind of still a treat to go into an arcade and play those games. And then, um, and then slowly but surely when I was in high school, um, one of the biggest arcade games that I played during that time was Mortal Kombat, the original Mortal Kombat. And, but I didn't actually go into an arcade for that. Um, in my, near my high school, there was a, a dependent or a convenience store, if you're not in Quebec. <laughs> and uh, in that convenience store, you had an arcade machine uh, at the back. And uh, we used to, with my buddies, we used to have uh, tournaments and uh, bets on who can go further on the original. It was really, really cool. It was really fun. And I used to like it because... The game was, you know, when you used to go to an arcade, like you had the console market at home. But we went to the arcade, it was like the future of games. And you were always saying, one day those games are going to come into the console. And um, it was always a treat to see the new games that were coming out, right? And then at one point, that's kind of when it's, like, it stopped for me. I used to go to arcades ever so often, but... Um, not as often. Um, and a lot of those, and, and obviously with the years, a lot of the, the arcades kind of died, died out, got closed, got converted to pool halls. A lot of them got converted to pool halls, at least in Montreal. Um, so, and maybe if you were lucky, there were a few arcade machines here and there. Um, and then that was kind of, that was it. Not, and I graduated High school, late nineties, went to, you know, went to college. So then you fall into the two thousands, where it's where, in at least in Montreal, it's where I think it slowly started dying. The arcade started dying. Um, there were a, a lot less arcades. Um, from the top of my head, right now, there's I think two. One that's more of a traditional arcade, where you pay. Uh, you know, money and you get tokens back and you put the tokens in the machine. And then there's one that's a little bit less conventional where you pay at the door a flat fee and you're able to play any game on the floor. Um, and also uh, there's tournaments there and um, it's called Arcade Montreal, which is actually pretty sweet. I hope that they, I hope that they last for a very, very long time because the concept is really cool. Um, they have every night uh, certain concepts of, um, of, um, you know, tournaments like Street Fighter tournaments or Super Mario tournaments. and uh, But if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You have about 20, 25 mach arcade machines, old school, uh, that you're able to play for free. So it's really awesome. And you're also able to have a beer at the same time. So it's like a, a bar slash arcade, which is, uh, I have to admit, it's pretty sweet. Um. So that's where we are right now. So where we are right now is there's very few arcades um, in Montreal. And there doesn't seem to be a resurgence anytime soon. Uh, and there's not really a need for arcades. So like I was saying before, when I was a kid, and I think a lot of people used to go to arcades for this, used to go to the arcades because it was the future of gaming. You saw the future when you went to the, the, the arcade. Now, no, roughly in the 2000s is when games started being really pretty damn good at home, playing a console. Um, and even around that time as well, that's when gaming rentals kind of started dying out as well. I think people had more the impulse of buying the game at full price, bring it home, get the value for it, and you could replay it whenever you want. Um, some games are worth replaying, some of them not, but... In general, that's, you know, you keep your games, you play them forever, right? And it's a lot cheaper, and especially the games are a lot longer, so the games are a lot cheaper than they were a long time ago. Um, so then the games were kind of at par, right? So, uh, you know, so instead of having the, you know, the um, future graphics or the future type of gameplay with the steering wheel and... That's the only advantage that the arcade kind of had at one point. It's you had the cab, the driving cabinet, or you had the, the race pedal with everything, which most people didn't have at home unless you bought accessories or whatever. Um, so that was a status quo, and a lot of people started staying home, right? 
uh, waste less money on the long run and on a typical game. And you get to play it however often you want, right? It's, you're at home. Now we fall into today. And today... Now, I know that also um, all, through all of this, um, you know, there's, there's strong arcade markets in the world. You know, Japan is known for having its amazing arcades um, experiences. Um, and there's kind of reasons for that as well. Um, essentially, the way that it works in Japan is, um, and I think I read this somewhere, um, so in Japan, a lot of the gaming, you know, before corporations got into gaming and console gaming and creating games for that, they used to own arcades and they own the arcade so they can put in their, you know, their, their own games in, in there and charge, you know, whatever they want. Um, and you know, so you're able to see new games all the time and these arcades are always packed right uh, in north america a lot of the arcade owners um, or at least the game makers if anything of the arcades uh midway taito um and a lot of those with a few exceptions a lot of them are out of business right now or they went out of business with the years whatever the case may be so um, in general, the market in Japan is a lot stronger um, because their primary, you know, goal was to take care of arcades and have arcades. And there's a lot. I've seen some on, on uh, like uh, I think there's it's Namco Land. That arcade looks amazing. <laughs> it looks. I have a picture in front of me right now. It looks, and I'll and I'll link you a, a Kotaku. Um, uh, story that will show you like why arcades and Japanese arcades have survived so long. And it's, it's amazing. And you have like gaming companies that have their own arcades. Like Sega has its own arcade with only Sega games. You would never see that here. It's, it's not even, it's not even in the conversation. Um, so back to North America. So here it's the complete opposite. It hasn't thrived at all. And another thing that also came into play as well, um, as the arcades were dying out, the price per game went going went up. Yeah, you can say it was inflation or whatever the case may be. But, I mean, an average arcade game lasts what? If you're good at it, maybe 10 minutes on average. You know, there's games that you can go a lot longer and you could get best scores or whatever. But in general, it's about 10 minutes. When I first started going to arcades, it was quarter. Yeah, okay, it's... I mean, it's, I sound like my parents at this point. Back in my day, we used to put a quarter in that machine. Um, and then it went to 50 cents and a buck. But at one point, I went into an arcade um, called Amusement 2000 um, in Montreal. It's in downtown Montreal. Um, and... Um, it was like two bucks per sh a shot for a game, number one, um, which is pretty impressive for a game that, in some cases, if I don't know how to play, takes like five seconds and I'm dead. Number two, a lot of the games I wasn't interested in. Um, a lot of the games, I mean, Daytona USA and Daytona USA 2, I think, was the uh, the game. Intri was intriguing. Because I like racing games, but a lot of the other games I just couldn't get into it. Um, it just, I don't know. It just was too much for me. The dance, dance revolution thing, or the dance games that are there is definitely not for me. So even if I was a fan of arcades, I went in there and I got turned off by the games that were in there, which doesn't help. So um, that's why it comes to right now. Um, you know, the best arcade in Montreal is Bali Arcade Montreal, uh, aptly named, uh, because they charge at the door a flat fee. You can play a bunch of different games. You can have tournaments. You can have beer. And it's awesome. Um, it's just that, you know, I don't know if there's as much support for arcades as there used to be, because arcades was known more for kid stuff, 
right? And now it's, you know, if you're selling beer and stuff like that, it's more of an adult um, atmosphere. But I think it's the right way to go. And I think they found a niche and I think they're doing well for themselves as far as I can tell. So I think, I think that they could part, part I hope that they survive. I think they have the tools to survive. Um, as long as they keep, you know, having those games, you know, have a turnaround of certain games that they change it ever so often. I think, uh, it's going to be pretty cool. And I think they also have consoles. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they have consoles as well. So, um, that's another plus as well. So it comes to the next part. So we went through what I did when I was a kid, which is pretty much in the past. And if I, even in the past, what I didn't even touch, it's my experience. But prior to that, arcades were pinball machines, essentially, uh, back in the 70s and, and, and so on. So, um, so that was really far back. But I was talking more about my experiences and so on. So we went to when I was a kid to where we are right till until where we're right now. But what's the future of arcades? I mean, um, yeah, I'm seeing Japan is thriving over, you know, the arcades. A lot of these buildings are look really expensive. The games look innovative. They're creative. Probably a lot of the games that would never get released in North America. But where do I see arcades going? And I think, as I mentioned before earlier in my, my discussion, is that... Um, The the gaming the games at the beginning used to or when I was a kid you were going in there because it was the future of gaming. That kind of stopped now. It's either you're at par or you're looking back, right? It's retro games, it's retro machines, and it's refurbished whatever. Um, but there's one market that hasn't been tapped yet in arcades. It's a consumer product product that's not in you know, yes, it's gaining popularity with the PSVR. Um, it's virtual reality. Um, good virtual reality. I'm pretty sure if an arcade would do contracts with the big VR guys, you can have a deal with HTC, the Vive, whatever the case may be. Probably go with HTC. I think it's the. I think it's a little bit better. Again, I haven't tested it, so I wouldn't know. But I think from what I saw online, it seems to be a little bit better. It doesn't give you as much. It doesn't make you feel nauseous as much. Um, at least the technology that they're using. And I think that's where it should be heading. There's no... Obviously, in an arcade, you can't play games that are going to take forever. You can't have a Fallout 3 in an arcade. It's never going to happen. It has to be platformers, quick games, rhythm games, which, you know, the dance games are. Um... But, I mean, what stops you from playing an authentic an authentic tennis match? You know, um, I don't know, a doubles match between Serena Williams and, uh, you know, and John McEnroe between you and your friend in VR, right? Um, especially if the graphics become more and more. I know maybe this is ahead of its time and maybe the technology is not there, but I think that's where arcade should be going. Um, and you can throw vintage stuff in there too. I mean, if vintage retro stuff seems to be a thing and it's always a thing, it's just that the decades change, right? Let it be clothes, music, games, movies. There's always a decade that comes back into style after a while. So at one point in the nineties, it was the seventies. Then in the two thousands, it was the eighties. Um, now it seems that the nineties is kind of coming somewhat back um and then at one point it was like you know the 40s and then you know now it's a mix of everything there's always part of the past that kind of gets popular again either because it feels refreshing or people just like to go where it's comfortable um so there is a definite definite market for that but there should be a part of it that's also the essence of what arcades used to be which was Fun, quick games that it's games that you could not play at home. And right now, that's what it is. And VR, I think, has a big potential. But I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, and I think I saw, um, which is actually a, 
uh, YouTube channel that I just started following, uh, Metal Jesus Rocks, which is amazing. Um, uh, and he went over, over the HoloLens by Microsoft, and it looked pretty damn good. And he was raving about it, um, and I ignore the host's name, and I really apologize. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but... Um, he had a review unit. They're based out of Seattle, and somebody from Microsoft was kind enough to, to lend him a, a review unit. And he was raving about it, and he seemed to have a lot of fun with it. Essentially, it's AR, um, not fully VR, but you can use your room as the, you know, the setting for whatever game you're playing, um, which was it looked really good and I don't and apparently the video doesn't give the graphics justice because apparently it looked even better in you know when you're actually wearing the headset um, I think that's where arcades should be going and you know at the end of the day arcades were what it was a place where my friends and I can go and we can play video games for a couple of hours depending on how many quarters we had and we would just hang out. And I think with the years, arcades kind of, you know, there's tendencies that kind of change. But at the same time, a lot of people became more homebodies, right? There's a lot, there's a less tendency to go to the arcades and go and see, go and play the games that are out. Um, one of the last arcades I went to, that used to be in a, on a street near, near my house, um, I used to only go there for one game, and it was pro wrestling. <laughs> they still had a working version of pro wrestling in the arcade, and I would always play it. Um, and it was it was super fun. But I mean, <laughs> um, every all good things must must end. And I have the version on NES, so I can't really you know argue. But um, um, I think that you know. The, and, and that's where RK Montreal kind of comes in, right? It's where you have a group of people that have common interest in games that go and have a beer instead of a Coke or a, or a juice when we're kids. And we just you go play games for a few hours and have fun in the meantime, right? That's the essence of arcades. And I think that a lot of them didn't make money anymore. It wasn't profitable because a lot of them are going. But instead of rethinking what arcades are or try to re not reinvent arcades but kind of move with the times they kind of stayed stagnant and it kind of died off similar to a bit like blockbuster right uh, netflix came along in the scene and blockbuster said like, we're gonna be fine and you know what they ended up dying so yeah it's um it's pretty um that, that's what I, I, I think is, is where the future of arcades is going. I think that's what the essence of arcades is. What do you guys think? Let me know. Uh, let me know anywhere on Twitter, on, uh, on Facebook. Um, what do you guys think? Where are arcades going? Are arcades fun? Are they still fun? Do you still go to arcades? Are there arcades where you live? Um, you know, I'm talking about Montreal here. But I don't know about other cities. Um, I know that they've kind of North American general. They kind of died out. But let me know what you guys think, and let me know your point of view on what you guys think about that. All right. So last uh, last thing of the week is my review of the week, which is uh, I had re I did review a review for X bike. Uh, Excite. <clears throat> wow. Apparently I'm drunk again. Uh, Excite bike for the NES. Uh, this, if you, don't, you guys don't know what it is, it's a 8-bit uh, old-school original NES game uh, that came, that basically you ride, it's a side-scroller where you ride a motorcycle and you have races and you try and go, um, you try and go into, um, um, you try, you try and beat obstacles, you race and you beat obstacles and you have like five other racers, you try and go. The thing that's really cool about this game as well is that at the, you know, for the time, it was really rare where you were able to customize your game. And in this game, you were able to create your own levels. Um, as crazy as they were, whatever, and you were able to play two players, so you were able to challenge your, you know, brother, friend, or whatever the case may be. And at that time, that was really unique. Um, 
So yeah, that's uh, that's my review. Um, it's still fun today. I think the the that aspect is still really really fun. The actual game itself, like the challenge, is not. Um, it's it's not there. I got bored pretty quickly. After like four or five races, I was like, yeah, I'm done. But the creating your own level kind of made it fun for me again. So that's where where that's what I think uh, about the game. You can go see it on my corporategamer.net website. Uh, just click on your on the games. I'm also going to put a link in the show notes. Um, so that's the show for this week. If you want to follow me on Twitch, you can go to Corporate Gamer Nine. Uh, follow me or like me on Facebook at Corporate Gamer, uh, Twitter Corporate Gamer Nine as well, Corporate Gamer on YouTube, uh, and also listen to my other podcast, AroundTable.ca, uh, the AroundTable.ca podcast where we talk about uh, entertainment news, music, movies, anything that's entertainment. We talk about it and discuss about certain different topics. So listen to me on there. We can you can listen to us on uh, iTunes, Google Play. Uh, and SoundCloud, and for this particular podcast, you can listen to it also on uh, iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, and Stitchers, and uh, that's it for me this week. All right, guys, have a great week, and talk